What happens in Hong Kong, now we all see, they through judicial way impose national security law and through this from Hong Kong, extend the authoritarian law, oppressive law around the world. And no matter we like it or not, if we don't stop a barbaric behavior of diplomats today, maybe 10 years later, we will see a war waged by them. And our next generation could pay even greater cost for this. Simon Cheng is a human rights activist who previously worked for the British Consulate General in Hong Kong. In 2019, he was detained by the Chinese regime and says he was tortured to make him confess to being a British spy. After his release, Simon sought asylum in the UK, where he continues to call for freedom for Hong Kong. I'm Lee Hall and this is British Thought Leaders. Simon Chung, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thank you for having me. Among people who follow the Hong Kong situation closely, I'm sure they're all aware of your story. But for our viewers who uh, maybe don't follow so closely, I was hoping you could tell us your story. So back in 2019, you, you worked for the British Consulate in Hong Kong uh, and you went on a business trip to China. Yes, um, that time it was in August 2019. So I've been instructed to have a business trip to Shenzhen, but when I finish my trip, then I come back to physically in Hong Kong, where is exactly the downtown of Hong Kong, West Kowloon. So I've been stopped there, and they gave me no reason. I've been put into the police station over there, which is a part of the mainland China, for a while, and for about several hours. Then they told me, because the rail railway station will be closed, so they would need to deliver my back to Shenzhen. I took almost the last high-speed train that day with others, uh, mainland workers, in the railway station to Shenzhen again. And that time I've been handed over to a bunch of plainclothes officers. Lately, I know they're working for uh, national security. So that's the ordeal that I start to experience for 15 days. So what happened next? Well, that time is very shocked to me because it's the first time ever I've been treated like this. I've been first time being interrogated by the police. They put me into a very small cell, a steel cell, and the tiger chair within the small cell. The tiger chair is not typical chair, which the chair is very uncomfortable, made by steel. Then they could buckle you up, you cannot move. Then you could shackle and hang off uh, when you sit on a chair. So you could imagine if you had been questioned by the police, but actually you have been, you know, buckled up and locked up at the chair, and you have been in the small cell. It is. It, it was extremely intimidating. So the first question they asked me was, "What do you feel about Hong Kong?" So my intuition is correct. They are political police because it's very abnormal question, unusual question, and definitely they are asking about protest. Um, so they gradually narrow down, you know, um, three types of question: who and who had joined the protest, and whether the UK government behind the scenes to instigate the protest and whether I joined the protest in a violent way. So they asked these types of questions repeatedly, and I remember that as for about seven hours. Then they asked me a very weird question. For example, they said, you know, uh, based on external sources, we know you solicit prostitutes. I never ever do that. But they keep chasing up to say, you went to massage parlor. I said, yes, but that is usual and normal. But they said, no, that is solicit prostitutes. And you know, that time, there has a bunch of plaintiff officers start stood behind those uniform officers. It gave a hint that if you're not cooperative, we will hand you back over to a bunch of plaintiff officers. So it's something like if you don't accept this, if you don't confess, you, you will face even harder charges. So I think that time I have no any other choices. Almost immediately, since the second days of my detention, I've been put into the personal cell. 
So my very uncomfortable uh, solitary confinement starts. And then they, you know, put me up against the wooden board, hung me on over there for countless hours. And they didn't talk. And sometimes they put me back put me down and asked me to do squat and lots of extreme position. And I feel very stressed. And naturally, for example, they keep asking me to raise my arms up and hands up and I cannot put it down. So you will feel painful. And if I cannot do it, for example, I shiver, then I would be bitten. I would be bit. They would bit me at a very vulnerable position vulnerable parts of my body, for example, like ankles and, and others, joint, um, you know, others uh, parts of my body. So that time I've been bitten, I don't know what it is because I cannot see, but it looked like a baton. And that is the first day of the torture. And afterwards, in the first week, it's keep repeating like that. They suddenly request me to do confession videotapes. And that time I realised that they felt pressure from the outside. And the thing they wanted you to confess to was, was taking part in the protests on behalf of the British government. Right? Yeah, they have different types of the confession videotapes. And so far, through the state media of China, CCTV, they broadcast my confession videotape is just one of those. And that dose is that I confessed that I saw this postures or something, but actually is because I've been stressed, uh, because they prepare two different types of decision paper. You could, they, you know, feel of those confession videotapes that they prescripted totally, but some of those that they would let you talk. But if they, they didn't satisfy your answer, they would give you the two years imprisonment for you to sign. Um, and that has a lot of many flaws of the uh, process of this kind of legal proceeding. For example, when the first time I come into the um, the detention centre, they prepare so many papers of the decision, pay, uh, the, the the you know the legal decision of the police. The only the top one they they wrote the the reasons and from when to when, but the rest of those that they all leave it blank, but I need to give my fingerprints on all of those papers. So it means if they just throw the top of that away, then they could write whatever they want, and I endorse them, that I confess. So I don't feel my legal rights have been well protected, surely, and I feel my future is definitely uncertain, and during the whole process I know is highly political and I already feel I've been very likely be charged by some national security law in mainland China. And I talked to them to say, you know, what happens in Hong Kong and I joined protest suppose is legal and even if I've been critical of the Chinese community, Communist Party, it should be still legal uh, that time in Hong Kong. But that would probably be shocked to me they said, yes, it might be in le le it might be legal in Hong Kong, but where are you now? I said, I'm now in mainland China. They said, that's it. And we can judge your behavior even in Hong Kong by our mainland Chinese law. So I think two systems, one country, gone. And I think even maybe lie, because if they are unhappy, they could habitually redefine themselves. So. That car thing, when I happen, I know I possibly would be further charged with national security issues and I could be in prison for decades in mainland China. So I felt really, really fortunate and lucky that I'd been let go. And every day, every time that I'm now in here, I also feel I have more sense of duty to speak out the truth, to let you know, the international audiences through here to let them know, you know, why Hong Kong people, they need to stay protest, why we have no trust to the Chinese judiciary. Because 
honestly speaking, is different carved political political system. The judicial system is not independent from the political power in mainland China. So that time, even to me, I I know that you know, if I've been let go, it might be something that you know the decision made by their masters. So. So this is the, the situation that happened to me, and it pushed me into the way that I, I'm now an exile pro-democracy activist. It doesn't mean, previously, I don't care about pro-democracy cause. It just means I'm not on the front line. I join almost every car of the protest when, I, when I'm able to. For example, if I've been in Hong Kong, I would do it. I, I support democracy, and that's why the National Security Police from mainland China noticed about this. And also that's why during the interrogation they showed me the pictures that I shown up in the protest site. And also is a side evidence to me is that there has eyes and ears, there has agents and informants. Actually it's quite many in Hong Kong. And maybe because I I was several times on the protest site, so I've been secretly taking picture. So that's why on radar of the secret police of China. So that's why when I was on the work trip, then I've been questioned and tortured and even nearly been sentenced in prison for decades. So at the time you were working for the, the British government, how did they respond to this? Well, first of all, they've been very carefully revealed the situation. They, at the very beginning, they think if they're going to be a high profile, it would drive me into third trouble. So they try to be a bit low profile at the beginning. And even after I released, they would try to protect my privacy. And I know that Hong Kong is not safe. So I debrief with the British consulate what happened to me. And I cannot stay in Hong Kong any longer. So then I fly I flew to Taiwan and we keep, you know, talk about my visa uh, to the UK, and afterwards, since the late 2019, I moved to London, and I seek asylum, and within about half a year, then I've been granted asylum. And when I spoke out the truth, uh, the then Foreign Secretary, Dominic Rupp, issued a statement to support me, and they, they think, you know, my treatment is a month to torture and egregious and then they summoned the Chinese ambassador uh, for this. So it was the screening of your forced confession that got the China Global Television Network removed from the airways and lose, it, lose their license in this country, wasn't it? Yes, um, that is about a joint effort uh, led by Peter Darlin, uh, which is, who is a founder of the Safeguard Defenders. And we work with other similar victims like Peter Him Humphrey who was being in prison in Shanghai for two years, and also Guan Minghai's daughters, uh, the Causeway Bay bookshop are now still being in prison and disappear uh, in Beijing. And her daughters is very brave. So we, we worked together and we issued the, the complaint uh, to, um, to, to the UK uh, Ofcom. Mm. So, we have a back and forth communication and of course that the Ofcom would ask about the rebuttal and their opinions from CGTN and then we defend. So the Ofcom read through both sides argument and Ofcom finally ruled in favour of my side. So I'm I'm really, really grateful for this because it show it, you know, like they're not very objectively report about this case and with attention to stigmatize me further. And I think it's a usual tactic as well. Because the, why at the, very, at the very beginning, why they would keep focusing the matters that to say I said as a prostitute, which is not true. I think it's because they try to stigmatize me to make me feel more morally dubious and make me to say my works are less credible. So I think it's also a usual tactic against lots of human rights activists uh, in mainland China. 
So this kind of systematization, the harassment is still continue even now. And you have to be in very uh, resilient to overcome it. And otherwise that you feel always like a mental trauma, that you be afraid that other people, whether that they will believe that false claims or not. And, but to me, you know, it also drove me to, 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 to be on the front line, to let more people to know what is the propaganda, how that's they would do, and what's the nature of the CGTN. Um, I, I do think not so many foreigners that they would know the usual tactics that they would do. And, you know, even in the West, in the UK, CGTN, um, the main targets would be focusing on the global audiences outside of China. So they could deliberately uh, uh, position themselves to be more moderate and be more focusing on mutual cooperation between China and the rest of the world. However, if you see their the same company CCTV in in mainland China, they go they're gonna be more hawkish, more nationalistic than they're always saying UK US are bad guys. So, so it depends on the tactics that, that what they're doing. So, yes, I think that the decision of Ocom is one of the way that we could expose the influence activities of the CCP around the world. You started your organisation, Hong Kongers in Britain. Can you tell us a bit about the, the mission of your organisation and, and what you do to achieve it? We set up the groups Hong Kongers in Britain. We try to consolidate the voice of the community, not to be diluted, because the United Frameworks or influenced activity is going to be very subtle. They, of course, will pretend as your friends, but actually what they're trying to do is to dissolve or dilute any kind of the anti-CCP sentiment or power. And why we're doing a groups here, ostensibly focusing more on livelihood, more local policy, more about the welfare or interest of our local residents or communities. As a, one, of the, one of the stakeholders in the community, yes, we are talking about housing issue, employment issue, education issue, just like other UK residents in here. But moreover, I think because we always memorize why we're coming in here and we have a greater sense of duty when we see many felons many others activists now in prison. And we have that kind of luxury that we have a choice to go out and leave our hometown. And here we have a sense of duty to talk more about our real story of Hong Kong. And that's the thing when we try to engage within the community and we think is very, very effective because it's from the grassroots community and we are one of one part of those we have votes because we are British national overseas, which is not only a travel document, it, but is a British identity, British nationality. And we regard ourselves as British nationals because we come here, we could register as a voter. That's why we have much more, you know, powerful tool to talk with councillors and MPs and let them to be more, you know, accountable to the people. For example, we try to expose the influence activities, underground activities, infiltration uh, in here gradually because we know Chinese, we know the language, we know the culture and we live in Hong Kong for many years. We witness how gradually, bit by bit, that the society layer by layer could be controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. And that is the first an experience that is quite valuable to the UK society because I think usually British society and even the government, they feel Hong Kong and China is far, far away. If they're not, if they have been ignorant to the Chinese politics, they might always have benefit or doubt to, that, to it. And even if they know, they might not take human rights issue as their top priority because they think maybe it's a foreign issue. However, if this bunch of Hong Kong people that come in here, Hong Kong, two systems, one country have been collapsed because national security law has been imposed. There's no real meaning of freedoms already in Hong Kong. 
You even could wave a flag, speak a chant and slogan, speak any words, or leave any comment. Could be amounts to endangering national security, and you could be in prison for that case or more. It's ridiculous, but that is reality. And this kind of things, when it happened, it doesn't mean it has to be in Hong Kong. The law already stupid, stipulate that the law could be effective globally. And no matter who you are, even you are not Hong Kongers, if even you are not Chinese, it still regulates you. So many people they come in here still with fear. So they cannot exert their own rights to have a protest in here, to be critical of the CCP even, because they are fear, they have been afraid of the national security law in the UK. So if we fear mentally, the national security law already in here. So we understood this is not one of incident, but it's a very significant polluted to the future. So this is also about the domestic policy and domestic matters of the UK. So although you're in the UK, you're obviously still very busy with uh, freedom in Hong Kong issues. Do you ever feel unsafe or threatened here in the UK? As a exile activist, um, have been targeted by a very powerful uh, regime, autocratic regime. I need to learn how to coexist with this risk. Like, it's always there when I always feel I've been followed, I've been told. And some people will feel it maybe is about mentality, is maybe you're going to be paranoid. But even paranoia is legitimate. So it is really, really at a very short moment when you decide to speak out the truth. And that is a life-changing event and is a lifelong journey. So to me, I feel yes. I feel I've been monitored, I've been followed, and I'm always feeling the threat that I could be threatened, harassed, I could be even um, uh, physically attacked someday by Chinese informants or agents, just a matter of time. Switching our focus to the UK, uh, in October at the, the Consulate General in Manchester there was a protest and someone was actually beaten by consular staff in view of the Greater Manchester Police. This felt like a kind of new level in the whole wolf warrior diplomacy. How do you feel British people should should view that of people in the UK being beaten by Chinese uh, regime members? I think it's a golden example to show it, you know, why it's important that we should know about Chinese Communist Party. Um, it is even beyond our imagination how fast that they need not to go through the third party to do dirty works. Even the top diplomat in Manchester from China could do it himself to beat protesters on the British soil without any legal consequence. And I think it's outrageous. And the British people, I think, as we are, because the feel for the protesters have been bitten, they are British national overseas citizens. They are British nationals. That's we should be really aware of that. First of all, we could reveal the whole incident. This bunch of protesters, they, 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 they held the protest, the state protest outside the consulate ground. That is on the British soil, peacefully. They have a lots of protest banner, surely. And many of those that they, their um, satirical pictures of Xi Jinping. And it's, it's nothing more than usual because Xi Jinping is a dictator. He stripped the constitution to let him to renew his chairmanship forever. He is ambitious and his brain China is going to be more nationalistic, aggressive and authoritarian. And as he is a political leader, so as no matter as a people and citizens in the UK, you could be critical of that. It's legitimate. But the diplomat said we cannot tolerate any kind of offensive picture or language to our great leader. And that's language of totalitarianism. He bought 
many his colleagues, diplomats, went outside of the consulate building, kicked down the protest banner, tear the pictures away, uh, 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 down, and take lots of protest banners away, is vandalism. Is actually is a property damage. And it's more shockingly that they try to drive several protesters back into on the ground of the consulate and bid them. It triggered a lot of very ugly scenes, the conflict. Definitely the protester, they want to get their property back, so they have some scuffle. So they were dragging them into the consulate grounds because they felt they had diplomatic immunity in the consulate grounds. They could even beat them to death without any legal consequences if they had been aggressive enough. And that's why Hong Kong was in Britain and we work with the victims very closely. The victim had been assigned a lawyer. So they work with IPAC, they work with Hong Kong Watch, and they work with Hong Kongers in Britain, and also the protest groups as well. So we also talked with Greater Manchester Police. We understood that they spent a lot of effort for investigation. They launched an initiated criminal investigation. They took lots of CCTV footage and did a questioning with many protesters and witnesses. They try to have the appointment with the Chinese consulate. The Chinese consulate officials re refuse to cooperate. They even with the police. With the police, yeah. they even refuse to to talk and to be questioned by the police. The police, but the police clearly, you know, uh, uh, identify at least six diplomats involved in this attack. So they re they they asked for the foreign office uh, to help to request the Beijing to waive the diplomatic impunity of those. Um, they gave them about one week uh, to do this and almost reached the deadline. Then Beijing said, we will remove those diplomats and we will send them back. So, so these people, they basically escaped back to China without any consequences Without any all. consequence. So what, what message does that send from the UK government to the Chinese Communist Party? So. I think, you know, like this, when they send back, the UK government still need to do more. For example, the judicial proceeding, legal proceedings should still carry on. Otherwise, it sent a very, very bad and wrong signals to the British society. They're actually above the law. And because they're from a autocratic and powerful country, so, so they could be above the law. No. Is, is unacceptable. So what the UK judiciary should do is it's a suspect of assault. And no matter, no, no matter, no, no matter what, it still need to continue the investigation. And if you already get enough evidence, for example, based on very objective CCTV footage, you see some people, you know, step them at that time, bits protesters, well, you could still like request them to cooperate with the UK police for investigation and to finish the legal proceeding. And if so, if they come, you know, if they go back to, to China, one day they could be not diplomats. Or they could they could be not executing as a duty of diplomat. Then you still have some leeway and chance that to ask for extra you know, ask for extradition if they travel uh, uh, outside of China. At least you give them some inconvenience that they will feel that is some cause to that in the rest of your life. One interesting angle to this uh, is that the Chinese regime actually invented a kind of counter-narrative as to what happened and they even made a, a Twitter feed about it. Can you tell us about that? Yes, that is at the beginning when the incidents happen, then within 48 hours, they they set up kind of like a Twitter account named Manchester Story. And they pretend, you know, spoke it, you know, that they wrote it in English, but the CCTV is in traditional Chinese, and some of those in simplified Chinese. They make it more multicultural and let more international audience to read it. Of course, that is on Twitter, so the target would be foreign uh, audiences, especially uh, the UK audiences. and. 
you can see they also through the pro CCP Chinese overseas uh, community and groups to spread out. Why we know that is from consulate because the CCTV footage is shown the angle is actually from within the consulate. So we know it's actually the source from the consulate. So we some from many a car of the cases like this, then we know the tactics that they try to do. They try to build their counter narrative, of course. And they said, oh, it's because the protesters try to get in the consulate because they want to protect themselves, to protect the consulate building, so they they have to do it. They have to drive the hair, they have to, you know, control them or whatever that they were saying. But well, I think if normally if the people they watch the CCTV footage as a whole, the conflict has been triggered by the consulate. They even cannot defend it to say why, why you kick down the protest banner. Well, if you say scuffle is from both sides, of course there's a scuffle. But the protester have been triggered by by you. The the protester they want to get the property back. Otherwise they will let you go. It's it's legitimate response what I'm saying. But the consulate themselves, they trigger the conflict and make an ugly sense and this is undeniable truth. They cannot even deny it. So if this could happen, we need to be very careful that to reveal what the future of diplomacy of China will be. Because to me it's a bit irrational. It's going to be more and more irrational. And as a, such a very great power is a very dangerous move. And we don't know, but it could foreseeable that they could expand in whatever way, like previously in economic way, one by one row, they try to be friendly with any other stakeholders to say we could, uh, we could achieve mutual prosperity and that there's a Chinese money, Chinese market. However, when what happens in Hong Kong, now we all see, they through judicial way impose national security law and through this from Hong Kong, extend the authoritarian law, oppressive law around the world. And let alone in the future, it will be in military way, more systematic way to threaten Taiwan and South China Sea. And that is autocratic power we witness the expansion, and no matter we like it or not, if we don't stop a barbaric behavior of diplomats today, maybe 10 years later, we will see a war waged by them. And our next generation could pay even greater cost for this. Uh, how do you feel that, how do you see the future for Hong Kong? Well, do you feel it's gonna be bright, or do you feel this kind of beyond rescue? Or? Well, for short term, it's still going downward to be worse and worse and worse. However, I believe the human life and the truth is going to be always the circle. Like if you're going downward enough, then you're going upward. So I am optimistic. I believe in the rest of my life, I still have my chance to come back to my hometown without fear. And that is my choice, that because that's my hometown, and I should have this kind of freedom of movement to go back to my hometown. And I foresee that day. And all the things, if you ask me what kind of the reason, well, I say, I would say, it is really based on the spirit. When every time when the Hong Kong people, if they decide to go on the street for protest or something, we, need, we didn't think too much about calculating the benefits or pros and cons or whatever. No, at the very moment, that time is only about your courage and only about your sense of consciousness. Simon Cheng, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thank you so much.